All right. Good morning. My name is Tom Gaze. I'm director of the Rockefeller Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's forum at the Rockefeller Institute uh, to discuss the findings from a just released report, um, The Impact of the Global Economy on New York State and City, a report produced by the SUNY by the Levin Institute of the State University of New York and the Center for an Urban Future. Now, we hardly have to uh, argue that uh, New York has been involved, has long been involved in uh, global affairs. Um, I don't know if many of you have read the book, um, Russell Shorto's 2005 book on the uh, island at the center of the world, where he talks about the, the, uh, the fact of, of how New Amsterdam was in many ways a, uh, an alternative uh, founding uh, model in which it was a highly globalized and very economically driven um, uh, settlement for, among the Europeans. But, uh, and that was four century, about four centuries ago, of course, in uh, the last few days, anything happening in Greece uh, seems to send Wall Street into uh, gyrations. So, there's no question that globalization has long been important for the state and for our cities. But what hasn't been done has been a fine-grained analysis of how and where globalization has affected our different communities throughout the state and uh, giving a, a sort of base of knowledge for thinking about what we can do with the many different effects of an increasingly open economy. We'll start our forum with opening statements from SUNY Chancellor Nancy Zimfer and Levin Pre Institute President Garrick Utley. They'll put the study in the context of how SUNY and the Levin Institute are addressing global economic challenges and opportunities. And then we'll turn to one of the authors of the study, Jonathan Bowles, um, of the Center for an Urban Future to report the study's major findings. Now after that, we'll have a wonderful journalist, Susan Arbetter, lead a discussion of the report and its implications with Jonathan, as well as two other economic experts, Heather Bruschetti, acting president and CEO of New York State's Business Council, and Don Siegel, dean of UAlbany School of Business. And after which, I hope we have time, we'll have time for uh, questions from the audience. Let me first introduce our two, our, uh, two first speakers. First, we'll listen to SUNY Chancellor Nancy Zimfer. Nancy is the 12th Chancellor of the State University of New York and has served in that position for two rather eventful years. Um, one of the distinctive qualities that's especially important today, though, is, is Nancy's perspective on higher education, the way she sees colleges and universities not in isolation, but within a much larger social and economic context. She's done that. Uh, for years um, with her work on educational pipeline issues. Uh, she sees higher education as really part of the broader uh, uh, educational process, really from cradle to career. And she's been a strong proponent in, in working with uh, community organizations, data analysis, in sort of understanding how individuals progress through the, universe, through the entire educational system into and out of universities and colleges. But particularly relevant for today's discussion, uh, Chancellor Zimfer has also been a vigorous advocate for making higher education institutions into more effective and accountable drivers for economic growth. That's been a core theme of her leadership at SUNY, but it's also been something she's been working on in her prior uh, in earlier positions at uh, University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee and the University of Cincinnati and as well as working with a number of national organizations like the Coalition of Urban Serving Universities and other efforts to sort of strengthen the economic and community building roles of universities and colleges. After Chancellor Zimfer's remarks, Garrick Utley will speak. Garrick is the founding president of the Levin Institute of the State University of New York, an educational and research institution devoted to helping New York and the U.S meet the challenges of the global economy. Now, in many ways, Garrick is the perfect person to establish such an institution like the Levin Institute since he's been teaching Americans about the rest of the world for some decades now. He's had a long and wide-ranging career as a, in broadcast journalism, specializing in international and foreign affairs, reporting from over 75 countries. 
He was a reporter, anchor, and host at NBC for 30 years, including time as a war correspondent in Vietnam and a couple of years as host of Meet the Press. After leaving NBC, he worked on global issues at ABC, CNN, public radio and television, including recent contributions to the wonderful PRI um, uh, program, America Abroad. Um, and he knows opera, having been a uh, host of the PBS series Live from the Met. But uh, before we hear from uh, Chancellor Zimfer, I'd like to ask a couple of favors. One, if you have anything that's likely to make noise uh, inadvertently, like a, a cell phone, please power it down right now. Also, when we do have questions from the audience, I'd like you to at least identify yourself because we're recording this. So thank you very much, Chancellor Zimfer. Thanks. 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 And, uh, Good morning, everyone. It's uh, just really a privilege. Uh, every time I come to the Rockefeller Institute of Government, there's always something big being said here, uh, launching an important effort in behalf of the state of New York, uh, in this case also New York City, but how many times what we launch here, what we talk about here, has national and international impact. So I always feel empowered and elevated and proud, quite frankly, to have the Rockefeller Institute of Government as it is attached to the University at Albany and to the State University of New York. And a big part of that is Tom Gase's leadership, and you all understand that. Somebody drives the agenda, brings the talent that the Rockefeller Institute of Government has to the task, and I want to say to all of you, the role the Rockefeller Institute has played in our strategic plan, the power of SUNY, the role that the State University of New York claims as a major all right, I will say it, the major economic engine for the state of New York, why not? Uh, and the quality of life for our citizenry has been emboldened by our work with the Institute. Um, secondly, uh, many of you know that uh, a release of a report, Why SUNY Matters, uh, hit the street in May. Uh, it gave us not only a very accurate and comparable, it's so hard to get the data right, on economic impact because everybody uses a different standard, usually one that favors them. Um, we have sorted this out and I think from this point forward, we will be able to give New Yorkers an accurate accounting of why SUNY matters to the uh, economy and quality of life of this state. And then secondly, as the Institute is, is so well known, for the vignettes, the field studies of regions across the state and exactly what we are doing for and in behalf of the state of New York. So uh, then, that wasn't enough. We asked the Institute to put together our first ever uh, annual national conference, nay, international conference on universities as economic engines. Uh, we intend to have a second annual, and I'm already wildly excited about the topic because uh, we've invented a new word. It's not in the print dictionary, but it is in Wikipedia. Systemness. What is it that uh, a complex, uh, sector-driven, massive system of higher education can do that no single institution can do alone? So in November, 2012, we will have our, they say you can't say annual till you've had two, second annual conference and we will have the input of the Rockefeller there as well. So that was all to say thank you to Tom Gase and his mighty, mighty team here at the Institute. Um, I will be uh, uh, succeeded by Garrick Utley. I'll say a word or two about Garrick and of course Jonathan Bowles doing the heavy lifting of describing this wonderful uh, informative report and I look forward to Susan and Heather and Don and Jonathan really revving it up in this panel conversation. I know that Garrick will speak as well to the co-chairs of this uh, important New York in the World project. Uh, Linda Sanford, as you know, is a member of the SUNY Board of Trustees and Alaire Townsend, they've done a terrific job. Matt Nimmons as the chairman of the board and Vartan Gregorian on behalf of Carnegie. Let me tell you, this was going to happen, right, Garrick? When these people threw their shoulder to this work, it was going to happen. So you have to know how absolutely central this work is, 
New York and the world to the entirety of the SUNY agenda. Very, very proud that it speaks not only to New York City, but to the metropolitan regions across the state, and I dare say to our rural uh, regions as well. I just came yesterday from the North Country. Uh, they are just as engaged in our economic future and our role with the world as you would find that marvelous island to the south. Uh, and what strikes me about this report is not only the data, the findings, the facts, but the pathway to implementing strategies and success. That's the magic combination. I think we all, in our own way, describe the status, but can we drive the agenda and really make change? And in my view, this report does exactly that. So who better to carry the torch for, for this work than the founding president of the Levin Institute, uh, the, the, the work, the power, the integrity that Gary Utley brings to this study, and everybody's living room for a long, long time and a proud history of giving us a, a credible and objective view of ourselves and then a pathway to success. So I'm very proud to be here, very proud of SUNY. I want to call out one of our presidents, Drew Matnack, is here from Hudson Valley Community College. I love that when our presidents come. There are a number of people here from uh, UAlbany where uh, the Rockefeller Institute fits in. So uh, Garrick, I'm just very, very proud of your work. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Chancellor, for that kind introduction. I want to acknowledge, first of all, before we get further into the program, Drew has been on our advisory council. Ed Cooperly is here, who's on the advisory council, and of course, Tom Gates. So to you and the many others uh, helping out with Linda and Allaire, it's really been a, a vital factor in, in moving this whole process forward. Uh, very quickly, because um, I know we're waiting for the panel and for Jonathan Bowles' uh, overview of what the study actually contains. Um, former journalists love anecdotes. We all like anecdotes. I started as a journalist in Brussels after a year of graduate work in Berlin in 1963, hired by the then correspondent John Chancellor. He paid me $62.50 a week to pay his, uh, make his coffee and pay his bills, and I loved it. But he said, listen, Garrick, if you want to be a journalist, you've got to go out and learn to report. And he gave me my first assignment. He said, this morning at 10 o'clock, or tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock at this building, Governor Nelson Rockefeller is coming to Brussels and holding a news conference. So I went down, and I remember the room was like about this size, and was crowded with cameras and reporters, and, and Rockefeller entered from that side, and there was a lectern there, and he started talking, and he announced that the state of New York was op creating and opening its first overseas commercial relations bureau office for New York. And he talked because this is the seat of the common market, and this is part of the future in New York. And he talked about that as Nelson Rockefeller did very well. But I remember his final word with total clarity. And he said, I want to let everybody in Brussels and in Europe know, quote, New York is open for business. <laughs> that was 48, ye 48 years ago, right? OK. <laughs> Some speechwriter did a good research on this. Anyway, to the, to the, uh, to the matter, um, New York and the world. Just a little bit of context. The SUNY Levin Institute you know about, we're part of the Chancellor's Office, the systemness of that. We, are, uh, we see ourselves as an incubator of new ideas, of new programs and projects. We deal with whether it's people laid off in the professions in New York City and Wall Street working with Mayor Bloomberg, or uh, whether it is uh, entrepreneurship, such a vital core element, the first pillar of the strategic uh, uh, plan or project. Uh, this, is, this is where we are, and we love to share our ideas because this is, we feel we're at ground zero in a way, uh, as, as we all are in our own ways in terms of what's happening in the economy in this crisis today. So the context for this report, it really began shortly after we moved into the Global Center on East 55th Street with the, when Lehman Brothers went down. We knew that our world was going to change, and we remember that moment. It's only, what, three years ago. And among all the other programs we started, in early 09 came up with the idea of, um, of this idea of globalization, that this was going, the global economy and the impact on the United States as a whole, but New York in particular, was not only going to be a critically existential issue, but also a political issue, 
a polemical issue, and we didn't know where this was going to go. It was op-ed pieces were being written about it, politicians were talking about it, and grandstanding sometimes. And yet there wasn't really a base of information on which so many of these uh, statements and positions were being taken. So therefore, a report uh, was in order. And I remember our then chairman, uh, the first founding chairman of the Levin Institute was Paul Tagler, who was still at that time commissioner of the NFL. We went to visit Pat Foy, who was then the uh, director of the downstate um, Empire State program. And it was just small talk what Levin could do. And we were going out, and the end, at the doorway, I said at the end, uh, well, Pat, but what could we really do for the state? And he said, educate the government about globalization and the global economy. People need information. They need the context. They need to understand it with all the pressures. So that was a seed, and that came back a year or two later. So in early 09, as the Chancellor said, we got together with the uh, Carnegie Corporation with Vartan Gregorian. They agreed to support this. What is it? Basically, the New York in the world is a, an initiative of the SUNY Levin Institute, and this report is a key point, a starting point to it. This is not, we do not see this as the end of a process. Work goes into a research uh, report study, that's it. People say it may lead to some action, it may go into a drawer. We see this as the launching pad, the beginning of a continuing process. Because the other part of New York and the world, and we've already done some of it and we'll step up our game, is public engagement. That's what Carnegie was really interested in, and how do you engage people with a resource such as this in discussion, in debate, which may become rather heated at times, and finally in the decision making that Nancy was talking about in terms of actual action steps uh, going forward. So there are these two components which will continue uh, onwards and upwards and forwards, we trust, and I'm going to be very much engaged in, in, in advancing this agenda and this initiative. So. The forums, by the way, we've already held three of them on SUNY campuses, uh, SUNY IT at uh, Broome Community College in Binghamton and Farmingdale and Long Island. We'll be having sessions. So we released the report in New York City last a week ago yesterday. We'll be, we're here today. We'll be in Buffalo uh, just before Thanksgiving, in Syracuse just after Thanksgiving, in Rochester uh, before the end of the year. We'll be doing more events uh, in New York City too. But the first step was how do you get from an idea to this? That's the first big step. So we had worked with and known uh, the Center for an Urban Future. Many of you in the research field know its great reputation, centered in New York City, but really its name tells the story. What are the urban, what's the future of an urban center, such as New York City or any urban center? Jonathan Bowles is the director. He is really the person um, who has led this effort with his small but very talented and dedicated team. They did more than 150 interviews and focus groups uh, people involved in focus groups around the state over about a 12 to 14 month period. They got into the writing mode. We collaborated very uh, uh, closely with Jonathan. Uh, we had it well designed and, and um, delivered. And what it basically is, the original concept, or one of the original concepts about it was, A, nobody has done this. This is the first comprehensive report on the impact of the global economy on New York State and New York City. B. Our argument is that no state in the nation has benefited more from globalization and suffered more at the same time than has New York. Therefore, we, that alone makes it a very important laboratory or a macro microcosm for the nation. Every, all the issues, the extremes are here greater than anywhere else from Wall Street bonuses to what's happened in much of post-industrial um, upstate New York City. That makes New York unique. And finally, it is a story. Today, to reach the public, you have to have a narrative. It is the story from when the Dutch first came here, and in 1640, I will not dwell on history, but it's part of the story, the Dutch settlement was formed, as you know, who you referred to the book, um, about how New York would be the center of the earth or the world. In 20, 1624 was founded, in 1640, a survey was done, and one person found that 18 languages were spoken among the 400 settlers diversity. In 1640, the Dutch West Indies Company was a commercial operation, um, gave up their monopoly on trade. Freer trade is going to be a benefit. In 1640, at the same time, the company decided we will accept investment from anywhere. In 1640, you had diversity, 
free trade, free flow of investment capital. The DNA was set. It moved up the Hudson River. It moved along the Erie Canal. And that's, I just say that as, 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 as the importance of roots and as part of the narrative. And finally, just to have this, this as one example of an integrated report of bringing this material together. But going forward, it's not just public engagement. There is more work to be done. And I would just conclude by saying that one of the things that the Chancellor and all of us are involved in is, you can put it in the word, metrics. How are we doing? How do we know how we are doing? That is key to any kind of endeavor, more so today when accountability is at the top of the priority list and it becomes our compass as to where we have to steer the ship, uh, whatever vessel you may be in command of or on board of. So we see going forward the opportunity, indeed the necessity, um, not only in the New York uh, in the World um, initiative at the Levin Institute, but also working with the Rockefeller Institute. With, we work people from the University of Buffalo, the Institute for you know, Western New York. There are many other assets in this room that if we can start to coordinate and pull this together, we can not only address the issues from many different directions in adding up or, or recognizing and defining the, the metrics, we can also start to deliver what amounts to what I call an annual report on New York and the world, or a periodic report, or quarterly reports. And that would not only be of great benefit to the state, the government, the debate, it would also be putting not only New York and the world at the center, but I think it would be very important to put placing SUNY at the center of the very core. So we look forward to working with Tom, we look forward to working with others under the Chancellor's leadership. But that's enough of that right now. And I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan Bowles, just a word about Jonathan. He's a former reporter. So we struck a common chord. He believes that, uh, and we believed, that this report has to be accessible, which is no aspersion on anybody who believes in 10,000 footnotes you know, on each page, but that this had to be a public document. There is no ma silver bullet. There is no magic wand. There are suggestions, the priorities, we are familiar with them. The real value is what's in the, all these pages of pulling it together. Jonathan, you did it. The stage is yours. Please tell us at least the highlights. You can't do everything. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, Tom, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, this is the second time I've actually been at the Rockefeller Institute. The first uh, talking about our study about immigrant entrepreneurs and the powerful role of immigrants in the economy in New York City and New York State. And that's kind of one of about 15 messages that you find in, in this report today. But um, uh, Garrick and the Levin Institute, if anybody here just doesn't know enough about the Levin Institute, please find out. They're doing some fantastic work. Uh, we were really excited to be involved with them. And um, I'm also just thrilled to be a part of an event with Nancy because I've been a big fan of what you've been doing. So keep up the good work. Um, you know, Garrick really framed it so well. In fact, when he, when he conceived this idea, the, the notion that, that New York was a place where no other state had benefited as much or suffered as worse in globalization than New York State. And he really got that right. We spent over a year researching this, and, um, and that message is absolutely correct, and I'm going to go into that in, in a moment. But I wanted to just say that some of the other findings of this uh, research is that it's, it's also complicated. You know, when we started to work on this study about the impacts of globalization on New York, we looked at what was out there, what had been done before, and, and people had this kind of emotional idea of what globalization has done for New York, but also for the country. You know, obviously jobs have gone overseas, there have been plant closings, but there hadn't been a real detailed analysis, and I think what we found is that, yes, a lot of those things that everybody knew have happened, but it's also much more complicated than that. So, for instance, you know, no state has uh, benefited more or suffered worse. Uh, but it's not merely that New York City has benefited, that upstate has suffered. Um, we found that some upstate regions have done a lot better than others from, uh, in the global economy. We found that New York City has benefited but has also suffered badly in so many ways from globalization. I'll get into that as well. We also found that growing numbers of companies around the state are figuring out a way to benefit from globalization through exports. So um, I think, uh, just like everything else, it, it's complex and nuanced, and we try to get to that in the study. Let me start with just a few uh, examples here about, so the idea no state has suffered as badly as New York. 
between 1970 and 2000, the state lost half of its manufacturing jobs. And everybody's lost manufacturing jobs during this period. But New York State lost a greater share of its manufacturing jobs than any other state in the Northeast or the Midwest. And that's significant. These are regions that really suffered badly during this time. Uh, between 2000 and 2010, New York uh, declined by another 39 percent, uh, which was below every other state in the Northeast or the Midwest except Michigan. Also, New York's population growth from 1970 to 2010 was also below every one of these other states in the Northeast or Midwest, which we call competitor states. Um, and just to give you a sense, uh, Michigan during this time, which obviously has Detroit and has really suffered badly, they've lost a lot of population. Their population growth was about twice that of New York during this period. One of the problems, obviously, for so many of the upstate metros uh, and for New York City to some extent, but, but upstate, um, so many of the, the metro regions uh, relied on manufacturing to a significant extent before the onset of globalization. And that was for a reason. You know, New York was the empire state. We had a lot of manufacturing jobs for a reason. Uh, some of the biggest companies were here. There were real benefits to being in New York. The infrastructure was here. But when things started to change, first because of competition and pressure as jobs started to go south and, and west because of cheaper costs and higher labor costs here and other factors that you all know a lot about, but then because of globalization and the opening of new markets in China and India, um, you know, a lot of these upstate uh, communities had a lot more to lose. I mean, three of the six major upstate uh, metros had more than 40 percent of their private sector jobs in manufacturing. Uh, in contrast, at the time in 1970, New York City only had 20 percent of its jobs in manufacturing. It had a, a, while it was still a manufacturing capital, um, at least back in the 50s and 60s, it had f uh, less to lose by the 70s. It was more diversified. Um, even Albany had 27 percent of its private sector jobs in manufacturing in 1970. So it also was at a slightly more diverse point in its economy in, in the early 70s. Uh, obviously, by 2008, manufacturing had shrunk much, much below the 40 percent level. So New York City, this is a story that seems so obvious, uh, but also I think was not well documented. I mean, this is why New York City has benefited. An unmatched pool of highly educated worker, workers, globally competitive industries, convenience to global markets, immigrants. There are other factors as well. Those are four of the main ones. So again, this is some of the things that I think people take for granted. Five, five of the, the five largest investment banks are, are in New York City. Uh, firms based in the city managed 41 percent of global hedge fund assets. Five of the world's 10 largest private equity firms are headquartered in New York City. The 12 largest law firms in the city have 122 uh, law, uh, foreign offices. Architectural firms, design, engineering firms based in New York City are all over the world today. They're building projects and designing projects in Shanghai, in Dubai, uh, in Beijing, in Singapore. New York City leads the nation in the number of international students in its colleges and universities. And we'll get into this, but, um, but this is not just a New York City advantage. It's really an advantage statewide. And SUNY Buffalo, for instance, is one of the top 20 institutions in the country in terms of attracting international students. Other, uh, other schools in the SUNY system attract a lot of international students. And that's actually called an export. Even though we're getting students in there, that's money coming into the state. It's, it's actually an export. And it's very important. New York City hospitals attract wealthy patients from around the globe that come there for surgeries and procedures. Wealthy art patrons come to New York to, to auction houses from all over. Um, New York City also has the port. Uh, it has fashion. So there's a lot of reasons why New York City has been one of relatively few cities and regions in this country that have benefited so much from globalization. This is an example of a few companies. You know, when we went out and talked to a lot of business leaders around the state, one thing we heard was that if not for globalization, the, the companies would not have grown nearly as much. Many of them would have had stagnant growth during this time. And, um, and because of it, and you see here on the left, you see the percentage of, of total revenues from international sales in 2001 and the total 
uh, percentage of, from global sales in, in 2009. We try to get data for a lot more companies going further back, and I think if we did, we'd, we'd show a much more significant increase. But just in that eight-year period in this past decade, look at the increase and just global sales for these companies. And, um, you know, again, we heard that what globalization did is it really enlarged the pie. And, uh, and if not for globalization, many of these companies would not have been growing, would not have uh, increased uh, jobs. So, um, again, as I mentioned, it's not just uh, that, that, uh, that this has benefited upstate and, and hurt downstate, but, but I do want to mention and, and take one second to talk about, you know, those globally competitive industries. Um, you know, uh, New York City right now has, is one of those few places, and, and so many industries these days want to cluster. They want to be with other companies, and, and, and it's, a, it's a way for them to attract talent from around the world, from a, around the country. But, but very few places in New York State have gotten that advantage for some of these globally competitive industries. I'll give you a sense of the New York City share of all employees statewide in the securities industry, it's 89.1% in New York City. Motion picture industry, 84.9% in New York City. Advertising, 82.3%. Publishing, 65.7% of the jobs in New York City. Legal services, 63%, and on and on. Um, it's difficult, as we found and we, met, we noted in this report, it's not easy for, for other cities, not just around the state of New York, but around the country, to develop these globally competitive industries, but it's definitely something that we think policymakers should really seek to do. Um, at the same time, obviously talent is so key to what New York City has done, and we find in this report that a lot of upstate communities have struggled because New York City, because of it, its place in the world today and its uh, globally competitive industries, it's attracting people from all over the world. A lot of upstate cities they're losing their, their college graduates to other places, and that's a, a real uh, challenge. Uh, another factor for New York City, uh, as I mentioned at the onset, uh, immigration. Uh, you know, New York City, uh, I mean, I, I think I can't overstate enough the role of immigration, particularly in the 1970s and 1980s, because so many, uh, New York City lost 600,000 people or so, and, and, and immigrants really replenished that population. They were catalysts for economic growth in so many communities that had kind of hollowed out. And, um, and we find in this report that hardly any of the upstate metros have had a significant increase in immigrants over this period. And, um, and I think it's interesting, and one of the findings we'll, we get into is that um, you know, a growing number of cities and states uh, in the Midwest and Northeast um, are actually actively recruiting immigrants today. Places like Detroit and Pittsburgh, uh, Cleveland, they, they are very actively going after immigrants today. Um, I think I mentioned most of these things earlier. So a few, few things about how New York City has suffered. Uh, New York City has a smaller share of manufacturing jobs today than any other major U.S. city. Uh, the city New York lost 300,000 apparel manufacturing jobs, uh, mostly due to globalization or international uh, competition. Uh, we have probably more than any other place a barbell economy in New York City with so many of the jobs being created at the very high end or very low end and not a lot in the middle. Uh, we were just astounded about the drop, as you see in the last bullet point, about the, the share of personal income in New York City uh, compared to the U.S. average for the four boroughs outside of Manhattan. While Manhattan's personal income levels compared to the U.S. are, are way up, in the other boroughs, they're way down, uh, almost at alarming levels. So major findings going forward that I think that policymakers should really keep in mind. Uh, regions with the greatest intellectual ca capital and capacity for innovation and that are most closely linked to the global economy have a clear competitive advantage in the global era. Immigration has provided a spark. Too few New York companies are finding a way to benefit from globalization through exporting. While we document a number of examples where companies are doing this overall, the numbers are still very low, and uh, we think going forward, we've got to really encourage more of our companies to, to export their products, uh, not only globally, but to other states and communities. Uh, that's not happening enough. I'm, I'm encouraged that uh, the Cuomo administration is focusing on that. Uh, that's a real opportunity. We should be benefiting from globalization. Uh, talent. So these are just very quickly, I'm going to go through a few recommendations here. Uh, invest in education and skills development, and clearly SUNY is, is a big part of that. Uh, develop strategies to retain and attract talent. 
Uh, we go into a few examples. That's obviously a big issue for a lot of the metros around the state. Embrace community colleges as mechanisms to retrain displaced workers. We actually have a study coming out later this month about the real value of community colleges. The role is not just to, to, to retrain, but so many people had been adversely impacted in, uh, because of globalization that there really is this role of being kind of a, a way of retraining it. And we have a couple of important quotes in the report from people talking about how some of the very good community colleges out there have played a key role in places like Rochester and other communities in really getting people that have been uh, laid off or, or lost their jobs into another, another part of the economy. Uh, create immigration-friendly policies. Growth strategies, another kind of key pillar of our report promote and support entrepreneurship. Um, we found in this report, and, and again, we did more than 150 interviews, we had focus groups, and, and we heard that while there's clearly entrepreneurship happening in, in every community around the state, um, we found that there's uh, kind of a, a lack of uh, entrepreneurial culture in a lot of places, a, lot, a lack of a risk-taking culture, um, and, and that's got to change. And, and there's a lot of things that go into that, but there's, there's some real advantages too. I mean, the, the, the relatively inexpensive cost of real estate in some communities can be a real plus uh, but we've got to just unleash entrepreneurship. And, um, you know, over the last couple of decades, I think the state has tried a number of things uh, for, that have been uh, kind of industry-focused that relate to entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship and innovation. But we also say in this report that, you know, yes, look at clean tech. Yes, look at life sciences and biotech and other natural areas of opportunity. But let's just support entrepreneurship, period, because who knows what's going to be the growth engines going forward. Even if it's retail, we need to be supporting entrepreneurship. Build upon the state's R&D assets to expand the innovation economy. Clearly, New York has some amazing assets here all around the state. And we need to build on them. We need to make sure our, our academic research institutions are more entrepreneurial and that they're really promoting entrepreneurship and innovation and connecting with private sector. Help more New York businesses export and compete globally. Uh, we had a Bruce Katz from the Brookings Institute on a panel earlier this year. He told us that 1% of all the small businesses in New York and in, in the US are exporting today. We've got to get that up nationally, but we have to do it in New York too. View colleges and universities as economic drivers for regional growth. I know, Nancy, you're doing that with SUNY, but it's such a natural area, and it makes so much sense because in this global world, a lot of big companies, they can go anywhere. Even if they say they're committing to, to New York right now, who knows what's going to happen in five or ten years because of competition or costs. But our universities uh, are here. They are, to a large extent, immobile assets, and we really need to make them anchors for economic growth. Improve connections between upstate cities and New York City. Because New York City has really figured out a way to benefit from globalization and, and is well positioned going forward, upstate cities and regions that are connected well to New York City, I think, are well positioned as well. So uh, from the upstate downstate, we've got to really build more linkages and connections. Assets for a competitive New York. Obviously, you know, we get in, in this report, get into a lot of really kind of forward-looking strategies, but we can't lose sight of the fundamentals, and we heard that in so many interviews around the state. So maintain the state's, uh, the state's key competitive advantages, upgrade the physical infrastructure, lower the cost of doing business. Uh, just a couple of quick points on these things. You know, um, as much as some parts of the state, the downstate region, New York City, parts of Albany, parts of Rochester are benefiting from globalization, this world is not standing still. There, uh, New York is facing more and more competition. It's only going to get more intense. Some of our most important industries like finance, but other things well, legal services, we're going to start to see more and more outsourcing or, uh, you know, we've done a lot of work on the design industries. China, India are investing so much in design education, and it may be that if we do this report in 10 years, we're going to see the same kind of movement uh, overseas in design and other professional business services. So New York State cannot stand still. We've got to acknowledge that there's this intense competition that's only going to get uh, stronger. So uh, we need to really compete. And I think it really puts a premium on skills and developing our educational assets. Um, and, um, and as far as lowering the cost of doing business, you know, I mean, throughout our interviews, it was really clear a lot of businesses today are willing to pay a premium to be in the downstate region because of that talent pool there and because they're in these competitive clusters. They want to be there. There's a reason for them to be there. They don't love paying the high, high cost of New York. 
and some will move, but, but many said that they will pay a premium. That's not the case in most of the upstate communities, many of whom are competing with, with the Midwest, other states in the Northeast that have far cheaper costs. So we definitely can't lose sight of those things. So I'll stop there. I hope I haven't gone on too long. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we are going to, uh, you, you met Jonathan, now Heather Bruschetti and Don Siegel are going to be joining us for a roundtable discussion about what we've just been learning. And uh, Heather is the acting president and CEO of the Business Council of New York. Don Siegel is the dean of the School of Business at the University at Albany. So um, the first question I have is, uh, you know, the report indicates that globalization has both hurt and helped New York, and that you benefit here from globalization if you are an immigrant, if you're highly educated, if you live in New York City, or if you um, are employed by one of the big industries. There are people in upstate New York, some of them are camping out across from the Capitol, who are aggrieved, and they're saying that the social contract appears to have been broken and by almost every measure, our individual wealth uh, has fallen. So how do you get this group of people, some of whom have been displaced by globalization, to buy into this? Or is that not important? Jonathan. Well, um, I think that's one of the key questions of our age, obviously, of this time. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a hard thing to get them to buy into when so, so many of the solutions are, are kind of future looking. You know, it's like we've got to invest in, in the skills. You know, these days, uh, regions that don't have uh, the real pool of highly educated uh, workers are not doing as well as others. Um, at the same time, individuals that lack kind of uh, a bachelor's or other uh, higher education degrees uh, have much less ability to compete for jobs in this economy. Uh, so obviously we've got to improve the education system, increase the number of, of graduates, but um, that doesn't say a lot for the folks that are right now struggling to, to, to do something right now. It's why in this report we talk about the need for real investment in community colleges to make sure that we retrain people that have been uh, negatively impacted, have been displaced from jobs right now. Um, but um, I think there's also got to be a real focus from our economic development officials, uh, not just on, on overall economic growth, which is important, but really trying to figure out if there's ways to get people, or ways to create jobs in middle income sectors. Um, or, or provide uh, more short-term workforce development training, which has been cut badly in recent decades. Uh, the Federal Workforce Investment Act dollars going into New York State has been slashed over the past decade or so. Um, and, um, and so, I mean, we need to help people that are, that are negatively affected right now to either get into jobs that have career paths, middle-income jobs, or we need to figure out how to actually create more of them right now. Is there, um, Heather, any, any sort of, or, or Donald, actually, uh, the idea that we're not all going to be really well educated and really smart and really good at business. So um, what about, you know, for a uh, future schooling for people who are, uh, who want to go into like a Votech or, or something like that? Where, where is that investment at this point? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that. I mean, I, I, representing the companies that I do, one of the most common complaints that we get is they have positions, they can't fill them because they can't find people with the right skill set. And I think there are some really great examples where community colleges in particular have filled that gap, but we need to look beyond that and look at K through 12 and um, start adjusting curriculum at K through 12 to focus on what the skill set needs are of the economy now rather than what the, what the skill sets were 50 years ago. Um, I, I think there are things, and I like to use this example, it's probably not a great example because someone can tell me why I'm wrong here, but I have three boys who are, who are um, school age, um, and all three of them spent an inordinate amount of time learning cursive. Um, I would really like to know if that's really the best use of classroom time with my children who can type on the computer already. Um, so, and, and it's an anecdote, um, not a great example, but, um, but I think there's, it, the report really highlights that we have all these great resources in higher education, 
um, in the state, we can leverage them better to better prepare um, kids, even you know, in K through 12 and then beyond, so that they have a better set of skills. And I, I don't agree that um, that uh, not everyone can be a successful business person. I think everyone can if they have the right skill set and the desire. So, tell that to my husband. <laughs> so um, I'm wondering um, if, if you think then that uh, there are if we should be investing more in Votech or if we already have, or I know that you have strong feelings about the Occupy Wall Street people, Donald. Well, I just want to make two points. Uh, the first relates to what I would call Bolshevism, and the second relates to capitalism. Uh, first, since this is a public forum, I want to staunchly defend Wall Street and the financial services industry from this onslaught, uh, because as pointed out in their report, Financial services is one of New York's most vital and important industries. It's a major job creator, and it's an industry where we have a global competitive advantage. And I'd also like to point out that our alumni and our students are occupying Wall Street in a productive way through employment. We have 100, just last year alone, we placed 132 students at the big four accounting firms, 40 at Ernst & Young alone. And if you look at Goldman Sachs, we are number three in terms of undergraduate institutions at that fine uh, firm. We have 220 alums at Morgan Stanley, including 15 managing directors. So we need to preserve our global competitiveness in that industry, and, and we're doing that at the universities. But the future, the future is really an entrepreneurship. And I think it's incumbent upon the universities and colleges uh, to really develop programs in teaching, uh, teaching, research, and service that promote entrepreneurship. And we're, we're doing that at our university. We just, this year, established an undergraduate minor in entrepreneurship. We expanded our graduate programs in entrepreneurship. And we developed several uh, community-based programs that get to that bottom of the pyramid that you were talking about before. Uh, and oh, I know that there's an enormous demand for this. 75% of the students on our campus want at least a course or a program in entrepreneurship. 50% of our students are thinking about starting their own companies. So let's take that negative energy that you see out there on the street and channel it towards wealth creation and entrepreneurship. And we have those kinds of programs. Just this year, we started the Young Entrepreneurs Academy, which brings middle and high school students to campus to learn how to start a real company with real investors. I'm glad that uh, Dean Breyer Lawson is here today because we just recently launched a SEED program, which stands for Small Enterprise for Economic Development. That's a, a basically a social entrepreneurship program that provides microloans, uses the faculty and the staff in both schools to help support these entrepreneurs. We also set up, uh, so I'm really glad, uh, Catherine, many of you know about this program because we've engaged in a, in a charm offensive to to educate everyone about it. She provides the charm, and I'm offensive. <laughs> uh, but there are lots of these kinds of programs out there, uh, and it's important that I really think the universities have a responsibility uh, to offer those courses, programs, community-based initiatives. And it's wonderful that we have a champion like Chan uh, Chancellor Zimfer, who's matrixed, it, matrixed this into her strategic plan, and our president as well, uh, so I think that's really the future. So I want to take a, uh, basically a question or a, a line of uh, argument from Thomas yesterday um, when we were talking on the phone. Uh, past performance by Wall Street is not indicative of the future because we're going to be laboring under more regulation. People aren't going to be taking as many risks. So um, while we do have to preserve the competitive advantage that we have, shouldn't we also be looking elsewhere? Well, we are into new industries, and I think that that's part of the, the great nanotechnology cluster that exists in this region. But I think that's what's, what's missing from that. There's lots of great basic and applied research in this region. This, this region uh, really attracts a lot of federal, federally funded research, industry-sponsored research, but what's missing is the effective commercialization of those ideas and that intellectual property. And, I, and that's what we need, is we need to get the students out there and the faculty and those involved in the research enterprise, we need them to
to g engage in commercialization of that. And, and that's what we're trying to do as a university. The uh, nano uh, school is frequently mentioned as a, a model for this public-private partnership. Um, but those days of enormous state funding, um, I think, are probably over. Um, if nano isn't scalable, then do you have a different template that we can work from, Heather? Um, well, if I had all the answers, I would tell you. Um, I don't. Uh, I think one of the important things to remember is that the reason we needed to make these massive state investments in order to uh, lure the kind of private sector investments that you see at Nano and at Global Foundries is because essentially we were not competitive with the rest of the world. When you look at the cost of doing business, um, we had some significant assets in higher education um, with, with uh, Global Foundries, you know, the availability of water. Uh, but it, it, to have to lure a company with a, a large stateside investment is not ideal, it's not sustainable. What we need to do is fix the business climate um, from the ground up. And, and if I could just say one more thing, I mean, we hear from companies all the time who get letters from other states. Now, it's not glo global competition, but states that say, hey, I want you to consider my state um, to, to do your expansion or to move your business. And oftentimes, it's not we're going to throw a pot of money at you. What we offer in terms of advantage is a favorable business climate. Uh, lower taxes, um, a, a state that will welcome you. There's been a lot of hostility, and, and the Wall, Occupy Wall Street is an example of that, towards um, some of the largest um, private sector employers in the state. And that's not always a good thing. I mean, if they're still run by people. So um, All right. Well, okay. So w taking one of Jonathan's slides, it, it was titled Assets for a Competitive New York, Maintain New York's Competitive Advantage. Um, upgrade the state's infrastructure, lower the cost of doing business, and that's pretty. But the thing is, you can't have everything you want. You know, you can't spend more on infrastructure and um, decrease the revenue that the state brings in every year. I mean, how do you do that, really? Well, you know, um, I think that in, uh, in the past, People have taken a leap of faith with, with infrastructure, and it's been a, a big investment. It's not just a, an expense. It actually leads to jobs. It leads to more competitiveness. And so, so I think you have to look at, look at things that way. I, I think it's so important. I think it could really help get the economy going. You don't have if to it, convince me. Um, yeah. You know, I, I also want to say that um, I think it's things like that and entrepreneurship uh, and innovation that are going to really be drivers going forward. But I think that, and I really believe this is changing right now with, with the Cuomo administration, but I think for a long time, um, you know, a lot of state policies have really focused backwards in some ways, and, and we've tried uh, as best we could to, to hold on to what we have. Like and what? Well, I mean, I think there's been obviously a lot of uh, subsidies and incentive packages to, to hold on to companies that are here and keep them from leaving. Um, it made, made a lot of sense because we kept losing manufacturing companies and others, but in many ways it's going up against, you know, kind of inexorable forces. And, and I think that it's not to say, let's just let every company walk, but like if that's the foundation of your strategy, it's only going to get you so far. And I think what happened was we weren't looking forward enough when it came to investing in our, our colleges and universities. Um, and it's not just saying, okay, we have great colleges. It's, it's doing things like our colleges and universities have not been as entrepreneurial. Coming from the presidents on down to say, we need to have partnerships with industry. We need to pull entrepreneurs and angel investors and VCs into the halls of academia and make sure our researchers and faculties our faculty are thinking that way. That wasn't done before, and, and so it's not. It's that's part of the commercialization. But the, the leaders of our institutions have to say, "This is my priority. I want to do this." That's when it starts to happen and bubble up. And um, and so uh, you know, in in addition to that, um, I just want to say also I'm on, on the state economic development policy. You know, um, things like what happened with with the nanoscience in this region, which was built on top of the assets we have here at our universities in, in the Albany region, uh, but clearly there was a lot of state money. That made a lot of sense. There were partnerships going on. We were building on an asset. But other things that were done, so for instance, some of the centers of excellence have not worked that well because they were much more kind of investments in a real estate project, not in creating the linkages and connectivity between universities and entrepreneurs or the private sector that really needed to happen. So you can build a big, a big center 
uh, a big building, but if you don't have the real bubbling up of entrepreneurs coming out of your institution, if you don't have the connection with entrepreneurs in the community, you're not going to get what the intended result is. Two more questions, and then we'll go to um, the audience. Uh, the, the first one is from the economic development incentives, and this is for Donald. Um, so we have the Excelsior Jobs Program, we have the Power for Jobs Program. Should we, uh, would you just like to see those scrapped and just sort of lower the entire tax rate for doing business in New York? Is that, the, is that a forward thinking idea, or what do we do? No, I think that what, if we're thinking about changing incentives, we want to change incentives so we have more entrepreneurs. It, it, whether it's a public initiative, I don't think they do, no. But I think that what, one of the lessons that we learned both from the report and from the two-day conference that, that Chancellor Zimfer held at, in Buffalo on universities and economic development is that if you want to promote economic development, you need to have, the universities need to be more startup friendly and really need to uh, promote startup creation, not just at the university, but in the region. And we have the assets to do that. I know in our region we certainly do. We have, we have institutions that have been formed to, to, you know, to generate that result. And we need to stimulate that around the state. So here's a practical example of how, uh, of what the state needs. And I was hoping to hear from all three of you. SUNY just received uh, the largest grant uh, that any single university has ever gotten from the Department of Energy for uh, solar. Um, basically, they want to do the same thing they did with nano, but with solar. So we have this huge opportunity right now to um, marshal all of the stakeholders and invest in solar. So what do you do if you were the queen of the world? I am the queen of the world, I'm actually. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think solar is an interesting example because there, there is such um, you know, a recent poster child of where you see investment policy well-meaning gone awry. Um, I think what you need to do is look at um, where you can sort of stoke organic growth. Um, and, and I know the word organic is overused, but where can you identify um, where natural entrepreneurship will happen? And solar certainly is one of those areas because there's such an interest in looking at alternative energy sources for, for some very obvious reasons. I mean, in, in New York especially, we've got the highest cost of electricity or the second highest, depending on how you look at it, um, in, in the United States. So there ought to be a desire um, for people to get into this niche. But if the question is, um, what do you do with the money? I think you need to be very careful. You need to make sure that um, the folks who are leveraging whatever money is given to them um, are putting their own skin in the game, um, for, for starters, and you have metrics and, and look for results. But when you look at real organic growth, I mean, if you look at RPI, there's a cluster of gaming companies there that benefited from zero um, public sector dollars. They happened organically because there was an interest there. So I think the real question is how do you recreate that environment where you have young, smart people who are entrepreneurs who invest in the community and make their living there. The thing about energy, though, is that every energy gets a subsidy from the government, whatever, yeah. maybe not, you know, apples and oranges. And, and taxed also okay. in New York. <laughs> you know, vicarious visions, I mean, I don't think they got a subsidy from, right. you know, gaming does not get a subsidy right. from the United States. So right. um, it's huge and it needs huge money to mm -hmm. start it up, right? So, you know, how do you use that? Well, just one more thing on solar, and I'm clearly not an expert on this, but, um, but I would say uh, you should look to New Jersey. I think that they've been such a pioneer in the solar field, and I think we can learn a lot from what New Jersey has done. Um, also, it seems like one of the things they've done and one of the things I've heard in general about solar, that whatever we do with SUNY to create kind of the R&D or kind of entrepreneurial companies that come out in that field, we also should be at the same time from, uh, from the state perspective. Um, Thinking about how we encourage or even mandate consumers, individuals, and businesses to actually use and purchase some of these technologies so that we're not just creating, you know, so it, in many ways it creates a market uh, so that we have the great companies that are in solar and ideas coming in there, but we also have a market that people are, are buying those things. So I'm not saying I know how to do it, but I think that's one of the elements that New Jersey has done and, and could really work. So mandating solar photovoltaic well, panels, I, but not healthcare. 
I didn't say that. <laughs> I wouldn't say that either. So. Yeah, I would just say you have to remember it's an embryonic industry. And in any embryonic industry, you're going to have a shakeout. You're going to have a lot of failure. And I think so one of the things that Nano is doing very effectively is they've developed an incubator in that, in that sector that's targeted to that sector. So there's going to be failure. Uh, and Heather is, uh, sorry, Susan, uh, he Heather is absolutely right in the sense that the, having studied federal technology programs, the best programs are the ones where there's a private and public, you know, both p support from public and private. Uh, in the new technology, there is a lot of failure, but eventually some strong companies will emerge and then we'll have a real cluster in this region. So what happened with Solyndra and how are well, we, is it not gonna happen here? It's not, well, Solyndra is an outlier. Okay, I, I mean, you don't judge an entire program on the basis of one outcome. Uh, what you have to do is adjust, you know, look at the averages. Is that program effective on average? The empirical evidence that I've seen is that it is, actually, even though there are these spectacular failures. Remember, this is an embryonic sector, and there's a lot of global competition. This is in your report, right? Your, the foreign country, uh, uh, countries are developing these technologies and spending very aggressively on them. Yeah, so that means we have to be more cutting edge, more innovative, yeah. more... But we have the best talent in the world here. We really do. I mean, that's our major asset, are, are the students and the faculty and, 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 and the talent in, in, around the state. Um, yeah. So, Kate Wilkie from Department of Economic Development, and I work on international policy issues. Welcome this report. Very welcome. I want to also mention that uh, Governor Cuomo's Regional Council Initiative is going to be highlighting not just regional assets but globally competitive ones for export expansion and for attraction of uh, international investment. And we work very closely as an agency with SUNY, CICU, the, co uh, the uh, Council of Independent Colleges and Universities, and CUNY on a study New York initiative. Um, so I just want to highlight that where we are promoting services export expansion <laughs> in the higher education sector, which is really important. So that's the commercial. I want to make a suggestion, if I might, for future research um, by Levin related to competitiveness. One of the interesting charts, Jonathan, that you um, showed was the increase in global revenue. What was missing was a column on employment in the US and New York. One of the challenges we face, particularly in global competitiveness around manufacturing, is the extraordinary subsidization in China and Russia intellectual property, protection, and risk, and market access barriers. I think particularly for New York State, and particularly for recreating a manufacturing platform, we have to look very seriously at the rules and the challenges in the international trading system around regulations and around subsidization. As you may or may not know, China has R&D parks that essentially pay wages, pay subsidies that you could not imagine. And some of our companies, it's not just a factor of a lack of entrepreneurship or a lack of talent on the, in the part of a lot of upstate and downstate manufacturers. It's rules, it's regulations, it's tariff barriers or non-tariff barriers in other markets. So I would suggest that in addition to, it seems to me that a lot of the focus is on what New York State can do around entrepreneurship, um, building assets, couldn't agree more. But what about, the other side of the equation and how we penetrate those markets. We hear from manufacturers all the time that are facing 40% uh, uh, cost challenges. And this is not just New York State's high cost base. We are, have high talent, high competitiveness. It's the unfairness of some rules internationally. So I suggest that is a future area of study. Thanks. Comment? Those are all good points. Um, I think, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm also really you know, ecstatic that, that you all are really focused on, on this issue, on exporting. Um, you're right that it's complicated and that there's a lot of pressures that we can't control. Um, I guess I, one thing I would say is, 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 you know, I think it's important to, to, to make sure that, that, this, that whatever the state's doing, that you're partnering with groups on the ground. Because a lot of times the small businesses and mid-sized firms, really, that's who they're going to go to for help. You may already be doing this, but I think that a yeah, lot, a lot, okay. Um, so, um, I think um, 
Also, um, to identify companies that, that really you feel like has a real good chance to export is, is important. So, for instance, in New York City, we have all these uh, ethnic food manufacturers. Uh, we've talked there about um, helping more of them get into some of the international food trade shows, like at the Javits Center and other things where the, where the, where the buyers are. I think that that could be done in many places. Also, uh, one thing um, that's not so much in the report, but we heard from and is that in some ways globalization has, has, has gotten a lot of Americans and a lot of New Yorkers really um, fed up with, with the same you know, uh, mass-produced goods here and there, many of which are produced elsewhere. And I think that in many ways it creates an opening for us to really promote what's unique about things that are made in New York and, 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 and in our communities. Uh, so in some ways, like a localization uh, is a strategy that we could, and it's almost the opposite of exporting, but, but, but it, it relates to exporting that, that, in that I think that if there are really special New York companies, people elsewhere around the globe actually might want to buy them. So things like Brooklyn Brewery, you know, and, 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 and you know, things, there's something special about that that people want, want everywhere. And I think there's things like that in all regions of New York State. If we can really kind of like pitch those and help those companies really reach new markets in the rest of this country and also globally, it's an opportunity. I'm going to get in trouble for jumping in here, but and I'm also going to get in trouble with some folks that I work with, but we actually are launching a madeinnewyork.org webpage that highlights um, products that are New York manufactured, um, in, in part because we are a remnant of a former manufacturers association, and, and we represent a large number of, and particularly the upstate manufacturers, and we think that this is something that um, might be a good idea. We recognize the value of promoting the fact that it's made in New York. So. Good. And I'd say one other thing about the exporting, I'm sorry, but um, often we don't focus export assistance on services. But like, for instance, in New York City, design is increasingly global, uh, law firms, and I like there are opportunities to really promote and help services businesses around the state to export as well, so don't lose sight of that. Hi, I'm Rick Kozlowski from Political Science Informatics, UAlbany. Question for Jonathan Bowles. Now, um, in your recommendations, you uh, now create immigration-friendly policies to attract and retain immigrants. Now, what role uh, can New York State government have in doing this, um, especially since immigration policy is a federal prerogative? And some of the items that you list in the report on page 93, uh, H-1B visas or green cards, et cetera, these initiatives have been stalled in the deadlock in Congress since 2007, and we haven't really seen very much progress and probably not much into the next election. Yeah, I mean, there, those are fair points. I mean, there's a lot that the federal government has to do in this area. But I mentioned earlier that, that cities like Detroit, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, there are some states like Pennsylvania that have set up like the Office of, of, of New Pennsylvania or the Welcoming Center for New Pennsylvanians. Boston has the Office of New Bostonians. Um, there are things that either local governments or state governments can do to really put out a, a sign and say, we want immigrants. That's one thing. I think also, you know, um, I think that there are struggling downtown areas. People have left downtowns in some areas. I think that um, if there are, you know, incentives in general for housing that's not occupied or, and I'm not saying that we should just say, okay, if you're an immigrant, you can get this for cheap. Uh, that shouldn't be the case. But I think that um, we can really advertise or promote that, that look, come here, you know, um, the mayor of, what was it, uh, Troy really kind of, uh, you know, went down and basically tried to Schenectady and, and tried to, tried to, you know, uh, get uh, Guyanese uh, residents from, from New York City. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it's a little trickier and maybe you have to be a little more creative, but I think that uh, regions and, and the state could really say, we want immigrants. We want to be the most immigrant-friendly place. New York has always been this way, and we want to really make it a, a leading driver going forward. And, and lastly, in a lot of our focus groups and in, in, in communities around the state, we heard that there's two, uh, two parochial Atmos uh, or attitudes out there. Many people don't like uh, immigrants, and, and there has to be kind of a uh, kind of a um, 
this has to be built by, by leaders. Local leaders have to really make the case for this and why it's going to. I think if, if you don't have a welcoming attitude, if people don't want immigrants, they're not going to come. Uh, even in Utica, which is one of the places that's actually really seen an increase in immigrants um, or refugees mostly, we, we found that a lot of people told us that you know, they, don't, they don't feel the most welcome. Um, and, and I think that that's less the case in it than in some communities. But, um, but get that, that kind of feeling and, and proactive support can be helpful. I think we have time for one more quick question. Thank you. Jason Lane from the Rockefeller Institute of Government. And a lot of my work is on globalization and higher education. And we've talked a lot about the positive impact of globalization on higher ed in New York and in the United States. And I wonder what your thoughts are on the negative impact. I spent a lot of time in the Middle East and India and China and, and Shanghai. And the discussions are about global competitiveness, about how do we build up the local higher ed system in those countries, thinking about the ways in which they import U.S. higher education systems, NYU, uh, Vanderbilt's going into Abu Dhabi next year. I mean, it, it's, you know, we're spreading our own higher ed system globally so that they could actually build up their system so they don't have to export their students as much. They don't want their students coming to the U.S. long term. This is a long term strategy. Um, so we've, we've, we're talking about the fact that foreign students coming into New York is a great growth area. Absolutely. They bring huge economic benefits to us. They help foster the issue of immigration and bring immigrant, immigrant students here. Long term, they don't want this. And we've already seen it happening with Australia. Uh, Malaysia has been building up its higher ed system, so it would not have to export its students to Australia as much. Australia's higher ed system is now hitting, hurting significantly because of the, the 20 to 25 percent decline in the number of students who are studying there from outside of the country. And I wonder what you think are the long-term uh, aspects of this for, for New York State. Well, uh, I w want to squash my rivals. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I don't care about business schools in other countries. I want my business school to have the highest market share. So uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not interested in that, you know, <laughs> helping them or, I think we have, higher education is a vital sector in this region and in the state, and we have a product that we sell, and we want that product to be as, uh, you know, <laughs> the sales of that product to be as strong as possible, and we want to attract international students. That's an important source of revenue for us, so I'm sorry, uh, I, uh, I'm not concerned about that. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's a good question because, you know, just like a lot of other industries, I mentioned services sectors are going to face increasing competition. I think it's only natural that we're going to see this kind of thing. I don't have any problem with NYU opening offices in, in, in Abu Dhabi or Shanghai. I think in some ways it helps connect people back to New York. But I, I do think that there's still this opportunity out there. I mean, we're seeing this rise to the middle class from so many more people around the world. There's going to be more people turning to higher education, and many of them will be going to institutions in their own countries, and it's only natural that they should be improving and expanding their own institutions, that U.S. institutions should be going there. But there's still going to be a room and probably more and more people that are going to be looking to get a, a solid higher education degree, and, and many of them are going to be coming to this country. So. I think you're right. I think it's going to be an, a, a changing issue. Maybe it'll be more competition, but um, but I don't know what you can do about it. I'm curious afterwards, maybe what you think. Yeah, and we have collaborative programs with foreign universities, so that's where you know there is. It's not just a zero sum game, but again, it is a competitive industry, and we are trying very aggressively at the university to attract foreign students. Thank you very very much. A hand for Donald, Jonathan, and Heather, and Garrick, and the Rockefeller Institute. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Garrick. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, thank you, Susan. That was an excellent discussion, and our wonderful panel of Donald, Jonathan, and Heather, and thank all of you for coming. Bye-bye. Great, great presentation. Really? Yeah, really terrific.